Don't ever do that. Ooh. I work for an airline. Don't do that. Nope. Yeah, don't do that. I know. It's, it seems really inhumane. Like <laughs> some of those ramp people forget about the dogs. <laughs> Not helping their case. Yeah. Like, and, and to, to get them a seat on a private plane is like nine thousand dollars. Sounds like, about right. One day, maybe if we have to, like, I don't know, see some relatives in another part of the country. Does it? Yep. Okay. Hi. Hi. How are we doing? Pretty good. Yeah. This is very, very exciting. Uh, none of us are fully normal. There's uh, a lot of things better to do, I think, on a Saturday morning <laughs> in an auditorium. We're all going to talk about chess. We're going to play, I think, 10 or 15 speed games against all of you. Um, and yeah, when I was in here last night, it was just the seats. And I've been to Florida a few times. I played in the, I think, Orlando Chess Nationals. I think I played in a couple. They, they put them in Orlando so the kids can go to Disney World after having a really good tournament. Or the worst tournament of their lives. Because <laughs> then, at least you go to Disney World. Uh, so I've been here a few times. And, and the seats look familiar, and like some of the carpeting looked familiar. But I was just blown away because um, this is not the atmosphere that I remembered when I was a chess player, when I was growing up, and also when I was a teenager, and now as an adult. So it's it's pretty mind blowing, and I have like an hour and a half with this microphone. The last thirty minutes are going to be just Q and A, and then I'm going to do a lecture. And that lecture will also walk you through kind of the last few years of this whole crazy ride of chess. We're starting in 2018, and there's uh, 2020, 2021, and then it's going to be just a few months ago, 2023. So three games from this whole wild timeline. Um, and I just wanted to take a few minutes before to just ramble on a microphone, because I gotta tell you, uh, I have a lot of subscribers, but that is talking to a camera in the comfort of my own home. Yeah. <laughs> and there is nothing quite like getting up on a stage with a microphone, and suddenly you're like, why is my hand doing this thing? Why did I do this like five times, you know? And then I'm really blown away at the people who can stand on the stage and just drop things, and just get everybody to like pause and think about something that they said. Uh, and very quickly I realized that my aspirations of trying stand-up comedy one day were like probably not going to work out because I'm like watching these people who actually do it and then getting up here being like, is that funny? I gotta, I gotta make a joke. I also have to talk about chess, so how am I gonna do that? Um, but then in New York, we did something on October 24th. That was the night that, uh, that the book came out and people were like, we did live guest the ELO, so people who bought tickets would submit games roaring in applause for one another. You know, somebody played a move and everyone got like, boom. Like, <laughs> they're booing a bishop. Like, you know, this is like, a, this is a sports college. You have a stadium of 90,000, you know, and I feel like if we, if we did that here, it's gonna be a little bit more instructional today, but even if we did that here, we'd be like, yeah, oh my God. Yeah. Like, you did the thing. <laughs> so that was, uh, that was pretty wild because uh, I, you know, I grew up in suburban, Jersey. I feel like New Jersey. My wife and I were debating this until last night. What state gets made fun of more, Florida or New Jersey? New Jersey. <laughs> See, you all say New Jersey. I was like, no, I, I mean, I mean, I hate New Jersey, but I was like, I feel like there's more stereotypes. I don't know. Florida man. But, yeah, Florida. Man. Florida man's so, good though. Well, we were, I got a lot of, I got a lot of crap for this growing up because I, 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 my parents were just lived in Jersey, in New York, but I only came to New York more permanently when I was kind of 10, 11 years old, and uh, even growing up in Jersey, like I had. No friends who play chess, uh, and, uh, and also like you know three or four friends uh, total to this day though. Um, so that, that that I suppose was a nice thing about New Jersey. Uh, but nobody played chess. Uh, none of my friends played chess, and I remember when my parents would go to like parent-teacher conferences, uh, they would tell the teacher somehow that oh you know he has to miss a couple of days every couple of months because he has to go to a chess tournament like Florida Nationals. Like what? Your son's a chess player. Oh my god, like is he good? He should bring his trophies to the principal's office. There was like no single greater embarrassment than that. <laughs> that you would think that getting fourth place nationally would be an accomplishment. And the trophies in chess were no joke, they were like this big. Like, yeah, I saw these baseball trophies, they were like, you know, they were down here. <laughs> I've only seen Taekwondo trophies that might have been this tall. And I have a famous photo, I probably should have brought it today. They 
maybe I'll find it in all this chaos. But um, yeah, I'm like the same size as the trophy. <laughs> They're great. But there was just no greater embarrassment. I mean, I did it once or twice just because, you know, my family was like, yeah, rip these trophies to school, you know. Who else in your school is like competing on this level? And uh, and I did, and I was bullied for it. Some kids were nice, but some kids would just come up and go, oh, you're the kid with the trophy. And I'd go, yeah. And they'd be like, wow, what a nerd. And just like, <laughs> chess when I was 12 to 15, which I probably shouldn't have, because I would have been a world champ. Like, if I did not quit chess, Magnus had no chance. I was, I would have, those three pivotal years of my life, uh, I, I like to think I would have been a little bit stronger than I am now, but yeah, quitting between 12 and 15, if anybody is like younger than that or slightly above that, that those are very important years to play the game, because you also form uh, like a character development in, in many ways, but I came back at 15, and um, that's when I experienced some more success. And I think my journey in chess was a lot of like quitting, developing a little bit as a person, and then coming back, and then trying it again. Uh, and uh, I learned in college, in between 2013 and 2017, that you can teach chess. Okay, you can teach chess, and actually parents really value that. This was before any of this was really all that popular. You can teach chess in New York City, and that's what I did. So I would, you know, I would go to class, barely, and then I would, uh, I would go teach chess. So I would take like a cross town bus to a school, and then where this kind of passion for actually having it as a full-time career started was uh, the second year of college, because I, I sort of decided, like, why? I don't want to work at anybody's school program. I'd like to run my own thing. Because I think I could, you know, take a group of kids, uh, infuse, like, a passion for the game, get them to study. And in 2015, I started at a school in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, highly recommended. Definitely go there. A lot of great food, great atmosphere. Uh, I'm not a salesman for any tourist agency, but... New York is nice, don't listen to what they tell you in the news. Uh, and uh, I had started on Tuesday and Thursday in after school with like 10 kids, that was it. And I was like, all right, we're gonna teach these 10 kids and maybe we'll play the New York City Championship in January. And they played in that tournament, first and second graders, kindergartners, and they got second place in New York City, which is nuts, because those schools are around for 30 years, 40 years. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is like, this, this is gonna be a career. So that's when I stopped going to class. It was like sophomore, middle of sophomore year of college. I, I just, I needed the degree, otherwise my parents would kill me. So I would like do my statistics degree. Uh, and then I would go teach chess and I started teaching private lessons and, and group lessons. And that was my life from 2015 until basically March of 2020, which is when something happened. Uh, I don't remember what, but it, you know, I still remember the day I left the chess lesson. I like left an apartment and I just gave a chess lesson first reported case of the coronavirus in New York. And I was like, oh man, all right, well, I'll see them in two weeks, I guess. And, uh, and then I just like went home and yeah, uh, that's when everything changed because slowly, you know, nobody could go to school and then we, uh, we had to try to do Zoom lessons, but that wasn't really a thing because teaching a six-year-old on Zoom, anything is really hard because they have the school all day now on, on virtual, which was just a wild time. Um, and I just started making some YouTube videos did some Twitch streams, right? Like, uh, let's just make some YouTube videos. And then there was three kind of pivotal moments, I guess, in the last few years. Uh, there was Queen's Gambit, which I'm sure, like, most of you, if not all of you in here have watched. I still walk into people and like, nah, I actually never saw it. Yeah. And I, I kind of get what that's like because I never watched Game of Thrones. <laughs> like, I just, I don't know, I was just never that into it. And then I became an adult, and that was like, you can't say that. So I just said that, sorry. Um, I don't know, I just, it wasn't like a personal choice, I just somehow never got into it, and then all of a sudden it was too late. I did watch House of the Dragon, though, with my wife, that, that was kind of fun, but you had to know like a little bit of the, of the lore and everything. Long story short, not everybody's watched Queen's Gambit, but most of us did, and that was a really nice depiction of chess, uh, minus the substance abuse. Um, <laughs> yeah, that probably has to be like explained to the kids watching in some way, um, and that's when, you know, I realized that people on YouTube were watching Queen's Gambit trailer, and how to play the Queen's Gambit was popping up on their sidebar, which I made months before that came out, because I didn't, that was not a, you know, decision that I made, uh, because I knew the show was going to come out, and I was like, wow, okay, 
Well, let's build around this audience that's going to arrive. Now they're going to get here and type in, what are they going to type in? How to play chess. Uh, how to play the soap league, right? And so I just started thinking 2020, 2021 was just content, nonstop. Two videos every single day of like a recap of the tournament that was being played online or uh, it's a chess opening video or whatever it might be. Uh, and then obviously that lasted, that hype lasted for a while. Then there was um, Magnus Carlsen, Hans Niemann, which was a very, very, very big deal actually. Uh, you know, Elon Musk was tweeting about it uh, and it was picked up by basically every international news network. I mean, I was talking to people who live in other countries, their native newspapers were also picking it up. So this thing, this, this thing spread really far and people were just getting into chess because of it. Like they were, you know, watching chess videos. Uh, and that was just a natural progression. And then January of this year, uh, we had December, right? We had chess boxing, we had some other things uh, like mittens, right? Mittens on chess.com was super viral. Uh, and, and then shorts, TikTok, like YouTube shorts, just this, all this scroll up content. You could watch something for 30 seconds, which I never thought in my life I would be able to make short form content for chess. And I've made one every day for this year. Like I, that, that's just sort of what's been happening the last couple of years. And it's been a wild journey, like to take um, to take just a passion that I that I sort of developed toward the end of high school and then in the early years of college uh, to teaching after school and, and like watching these kids progress in these tournaments uh, to having to completely change all of that because now you can't do chess lessons anymore because the world shut down, which was surreal. So it's just like, all right, I'm going to give this online thing a shot. Uh, and I, I would just say that I generated the same degree of, of passion and excitement for the game that I had when I would go teach, you know, after school uh, to whoever was willing to watch. Uh, and as is evident, I suppose, from all the people in this room, uh, a lot of people have gotten into chess. A lot of people rekindled an interest in chess that maybe they had uh, in their younger years uh, or are trying it for the first time. And the thing I'm blown away the most with is I get invited sometimes to YouTube events. And I'm sitting next to somebody who has like 18 million subscribers, which is just like, doesn't even make sense to me. And they have like 8 billion total views and you know, they make generalist content. Like they make content that anybody can enjoy for like a little bit and it's kind of fun and it's exciting and everything. And then there's some creators that are hyper focused in, in, in one age range, but they get like the entire planet to watch them at that age range. And chess is just, the other day in New York, like a four year old came up to me. Uh, and, and prior to that, there was a, you know, in Las Vegas and an 80 year old retired pilot came up to me and that that to me is special that to me is is like mind-blowing that chess is just this this thing that you will you will always do a little bit of we, it's, it's not like a, a trend anymore it's not like a fad it's not a game that's gonna kind of go out of you know uh, like a Fall Guys or an Among Us or I don't know some other video game that's super super popular and then everyone's like playing the next thing um, it's really become like a part of people's lives and uh, it's always been a part of my life. I don't think it'll it'll ever stop. I keep you know saying I don't know five more years. Like at some point, I can't upload a YouTube video every single day. Uh, but uh, we're not there yet. Uh, we're no, we're nowhere near that yet. And now I'm I'm thinking of things like the book. I want people to have a conversation in five years where they go, "What's like the easiest way to learn chess as a beginner?" And uh, they say, uh, "How to win a chess uh, by this guy who I used to watch on YouTube. He doesn't make videos anymore, but you know now he's I don't know sailing." Both competitively in some you know, island somewhere. I, I don't know what the future holds, but uh, it's 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 been a really wild journey, and uh, and I'm you know I'm super grateful. And I the last thing I will leave you off with before uh, we do the official lecture, and I'll take you kind of through the, the last few years as well, um, is uh, I never thought I would do college visits because the only time I had a college reach out it was Harvard, which. You know, I saw Harvard, I said, okay. And then they would, they barely wanted to cover my train ticket. Oh, uh, and it's Harvard, yeah, you know? Uh, I was like, what? Harvard is, it? really? Yeah. And they have like a good chess club and everything, you know? They have like some strong players, they, they can leave. And I'm like, yeah, dude, sorry, you might have to buy your own train ticket to come here. And I was like, okay, well, that's obviously not going to, uh, to work. Maybe I'll visit, but for now, we'll just make fun of them here. <laughs> <laughs> and then UF reached out, and then they said, room and everything and it, you know there's a capacity of 800 hopefully they fill up and we don't you know oversee the entire thing uh, but this is special because I had to spend probably 17 years of my life not telling anybody I played chess then I had to teach chess for a little bit that was still a very small thing uh, and now it's 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 enormous I mean 
everybody is playing chess. It's almost more weird now to not have given chess a try in the last few years uh, than to have given it a try at all. So um, thank you all for coming out today. And uh, I have to you know, teach and educate, and I will, I, I will do that until 11. And then we will um, do a Q&A, and then we will play some games. So well, I'm very excited. Unfortunately, this game was the first of three, uh, you know, in the, in the chronological order of my life. This game was played February 2018. So this is the only game that I've ever played against Magnus. Uh, I was not a YouTuber. I was not even a streamer in February of 2018. Like, at all. Uh, this was, as, you know, I think you can see it's like February 26th. I think I tried one or two Twitch streams at the time, but I was enjoying it, and I was still teaching chess. So I was like, yeah, maybe I'll, you know, I'll do some Twitch streams uh, in the evening or something, and, and that's sort of what I was doing at the time. Uh, and do we want to look at it from Magnus' perspective or my perspective? Yours. 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 All right, well, what's it, what's it like to play against Magnus? So, you know, Magnus was playing these online titled arena tournaments, these bullet tournaments, and, uh, and I would play too, not to play him, but just to see how many Grandmasters I could lose to. And I got Magnus, you know, and I thought, um, I remember when I was, I wasn't streaming, I was just on my laptop, sitting in bed, uh, playing on my touch screen. I had a touch screen laptop. <laughs> he hitting the screen with my finger. And, um, and he started with Knight F3, uh, which, is the, uh, which is the ready opening. And I played F5, which is, I mean, there's a lot of things you can play against uh, the ready. It's a very flexible move. Uh, and I played F5, which is a pretty aggressive move, and it's pretty dangerous because you're trying to play the Dutch defense. And then you can play one of the variations of the Dutch defense, like... This one, right? It's like going to a you know a city, but going to a different neighborhood. Uh, and he he played a pretty passive approach. Um, the best approach against this move because it's so committal is to just try to push for e4. You could also do it right away, which is a, which is a gambit that's very very aggressive. But luckily for me, you know he played something a little bit uh, more solid. And I have to stop this mouse from biting down the street. There we go. Uh, and I we just developed our pieces, right? He he developed, I developed. I went for this. Leningrad setup uh, with the bishop here and knight, and then you know he'll try to expand, and I'm going to try to play for one of these two moves, either e5 or c5. Uh, also, at this point, you know I knew I was playing Magnus. He didn't know he was playing Gotham Chess because um, <laughs> I didn't know I, I was Gotham Chess yet. So I, I was, uh, you know, uh, there was a lot more pressure on my shoulders. Also, in 2018, I think he was uh, he was like I think that was one of his best years. So. He was, he was very, very, very strong and very scary. And, you know, when he opened the center with E4, I thought, oh, my God, my time is limited in this game, you know. But again, it's a bullet game, so I don't have a lot of time to panic, which is actually why it's my uh, best time control. I don't have time to get anxiety, which I've realized. Like, in three minutes, is still a little bit of time, and in 90 minute chess, any of you show of hands have played, like, classical chess live over the board? You are all very brave. You know the stresses, I would imagine. Like, it's a, it's a full day endeavor, it's 90 minutes, and there is literally no other sport on the planet where you could go from completely winning, like, unfathomably winning, to immediately losing in one move. Like, even in football, it'll take two quarters, right? Falcons, Patriots, like, you know, it'll take, like, some time, you know, for one of the greatest collapses of all time to happen or something like that. Sorry, Atlanta fans, I'm getting the intro down. Uh, but uh, it takes time, and chess, you could build this beautiful thing for hours, and it's just gone. Uh, but in bullet chess, you don't have that. You know, you, you, I don't have that panic. So I'm, you know, I, I, I struck the center, and, and at this point, I was like, wait a minute. I think I have a pretty good position against Magnus because, you know, we have symmetrical pawns, but his is actually a weakness because it's isolated. I have a cluster of pawns, and we traded a couple of pawns. So now the position is becoming more open, right? Which remember, I have to do a bear. I don't know everybody's strength, so I'm gonna if I explain some things, and everybody, and, and you're sitting there like, I know this stuff. Some, some other folks uh, may not. So, you know, the position is definitely opening up, right? You have to look mostly at what your opponent's pieces are doing. That's actually a secret of becoming like a stronger player. It's a lot less about what you want and a lot more about what their pieces see. So I wanted to take and I wanted to open up his king, uh, which is why he played this move, because he's the world champion uh, at the time. And so I went here to put more pressure on this and he defended and 
then I figured, okay, there's no point trying to you know bust the door down yet. So let's bring the queen up. And uh, he developed, I developed, and then he went here. And now, now things are getting really, really sharp. They're getting really complicated. So queen move, first thing you gotta ask, what's it doing? It has eyes on this, and it's actually threatening that. And then if you're really strong, even you go and move beyond this and go, oh, but then, then my knight is hanging. And then if I move my knight, this pawn's hanging. And actually, the rook sees the pawn through the knight, so that's also a problem. And actually, if the rook and the queen team up, that's, that's gonna be a skewer, oh my god, right? Like, very easy to drive yourself uh, crazy here. And then I thought, okay, well, what else did that queen move do? It uh, stopped guarding something. Yes, it's got all of these you know, different pressure points, but it stopped guarding this pawn. So now if I take, then I'm able to take that pawn. But the scary thing about that is that, you know, he's gonna probably go here, and he's going to be attacking my king. But when you have 45 seconds on the clock, you, you just you have yeah, you just have to do something. And I was really afraid of this, and I didn't want to just play something like pawn here and just try to play defense. Uh, because pawn here. Every time a pawn moves, what does it weaken, right? It makes these squares stronger, but that's weak. And I, I don't know how comfortable I feel with that. That looks really bad. And then that, and then, you know, that, that really looks unpleasant. So I thought, all right, you know what? I'm gonna take his knife. And he took back, and the cursor keeps sliding down because it's on a slant. I apologize. And I went here, which this thing gives, you know, it's like the most frustrating little thing in game review. When you're like, well, I took a free pawn, and it's like, yeah, well, you're an idiot, and you should never play chess again. <laughs> <laughs> so I just took a free pawn. Like, I, don't, <laughs> I don't know why you're so rude. Uh, Bishop takes, and he actually traded queens, which, you know, he, he, got, one, he got one of these too, so yeah, take that, Magnus. Uh, apparently, he was supposed to leave that pawn, even though it's a check, and he was supposed to take the pawn on b7. So he should have stayed patient, because that one's not going anywhere, and then he has some really, you know, annoying things around my king. Uh, but we traded. I mean, we traded the pieces, and like, would you believe it? It's two rooks and a bishop and five pawns each against the best chess player to ever walk the earth, probably. So I remember sitting there. We had about thirty seconds on the clock, and this was 2018. This was before any of the content, any of that stuff. So actually, 2018 was the, was my best year of chess. Uh, I was unofficially. In, in 2018, I, I got the International Master title. So I was 22 years old, I got the title, which now the average nine-year-old can get, uh, which is like really sad. Like when I was 12, I was the number two, number three ranked 12-year-old in the country, and I was 2060. And so now, if you're 2060, I mean, we can check the list, but you're probably top 20, top 30. Like eight-year-olds and seven-year-olds are 2,000 now, relatively consistently, which is really scary. But back then, it was a really big accomplishment. Can anybody guess who number one was? You know him. No, he's a little older than I am. Kerry Kasparov was definitely uh, older than me, but also definitely, I actually don't know what he was when he was 12, but I would imagine he was close to him. Uh, it's a similar vein to Rosa. It was Danny, Haru? No, 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 Haru's 1987. Guys, do I look that old? Yes. <laughs> have, I, have I aged that much? Yes, it was Nara Dizzy. Yes, he actually it was his birthday two days ago? Yesterday? Two days. I think he's November 9th. So he graduated to uh, 28 years old. He's out of the Rockstar Club uh, of being 27 and um, unfortunately passing away way too young. Uh, but he's 28 now, so he graduated. Yes, he was number one. He was um, 2,250 or something, at, or 2,300, and he was 12, which still is really unimpressive, by the way, because Abhimanyu Mishra. Uh, Became the youngest grandmaster of all time, uh, American Indian, and you know he's uh, he's he, he got it at twelve in like a month. <laughs> and there this he was twenty two hundred, but that back then that was really really impressive. And um, you know now, and then I went like I said I, I quit when I was twelve. I quit up until I was about fifteen years old. So I never really in my life I never thought I would be a title player. Even in college I was rated twenty two. 40 internationally, so FIDE, the international rating, which is how these Grandmaster titles are calculated. Uh, and that's generally 100 points uh, lower than your US rating. So if your US rating is 1800, your FIDE rating would be something like 1700. Generally, it's not a hard rule. Uh, 
Um, and in 2018 was, was my best year. That was a year where that was, I was still teaching in, in Brooklyn and New York. And I, I played like six tournaments in a row over the course of the summer. And I, I said, I'm going to try to become an international master. Uh, and I did, literally immediately. My first three tournaments, I had enormous results. I gained like hundreds of points and, and I became an international master. And in retrospect, this is maybe even a life lesson. I mean, I'm a chess YouTuber. I don't know how many life lessons you can learn from me, but <laughs> set your goals a little higher. Because what happened to me is um, I just totally burned out. Like that, a mental, it's just like a, a switch just flipped. And I thought, wow, I got, I, that's it, cool. But I was, you know, 68 points away from becoming a grandmaster, and probably just needed a little bit more momentum. Uh, and uh, yeah, none, none of that happened. Like I, it was just, you know, literally unplugging a microphone or a display. And I, and the next few tournaments I bombed, which I had, I had already planned those tournaments. I had planned six tournaments because I thought I would need all six. Uh, and um, but when we played this game, it, you know, it was early 2018. It was even before that run. But I was still, I was still confident, and I, I didn't have the nerves that I. That today uh, and uh, you know Magnus uh, blundered uh, immediately in this position and I actually found the best move which is not really a sacrifice of the rook I know it's like the big, it, it's this move he can't really take it because he gets checkmated which is uh, which is kind of a nice tactic I will show that um, yeah he just thought he was taking all of my pawns but but this move I just thought was game over because if he takes it's a back rank checkmate because my bishop is spinning, uh, some of you might think like, is it better to take like this because it's a check? And if the rook takes, the same exact checkmate actually happens. But the bigger problem here is the resulting position. You actually don't have a threat. So you played the move that you thought was more forcing, which is generally how we play chess, and now you don't really have a threat. Um, and now you might have to move your rook or your bishop, and then it's gonna be a big trade, and maybe you'll make a draw. But actually, by far the more impactful move is rook takes, because now it's a discover check, and this rook can go attack anybody, and the king can't go here, because that would be checkmate. So if anybody was thinking this move, please scrub that out of your head. You would, you would just facilitate you know, Black's plan. And I thought, oh my god, like my, obviously your heart starts racing, right? You're gonna, you're gonna beat Magnus, he goes here. And I was like, okay, everything is defended, right? So if I move my rook anywhere, he's going to take Bishop. Well, then, self-explanatory, I should obviously play rook to f4, which gets a big uh, inaccurate move, but I thought it was really clever because it's a check, he has to take my bishop, and then I'm just going to take back, and I'm up a rook for a bishop against Magnus Carlsen. What on earth? This this can't be happening. Yeah, computers just like, yeah, be patient. They would just like go here, and then, you know, the bishop's guarded there, and then take your time. But I thought, no, I have to cash out of the casino right now, and, uh, you know, we got, we got to this position. Walk in the park. We can beat anybody from this position. Two rooks, bishop, uh, versus a rook and a bishop. Same exact pawns, right? So he went here, which I mean, that's like a normal move. I don't know why it's complaining. Uh, and what I should have done here is I should have brought my king up. Uh, instead, I panicked, which is standard, uh, and I played here, which actually literally does nothing uh, because both of the pawns are defended by his bishop. And not only does it do nothing, he can now give me a check and force my king out and give me another check and then whip my pawn. So now his drawing chances are much higher. His drawing chances are much higher because his winning chances are negative because you know quite, you have to know what you're playing for in chess, right? Like sometimes you're not really playing for a win, you're just trying to stabilize and not lose. Uh, and instead of panicking, I should have brought my king up, or I should have you know, protected the seventh rank, or I could have went here or just about literally any other plan than the one I played. Uh, but that happens, you know, and uh, rookie two, he went here, and then took my pawn, and at this point, a, a, a reality started setting in that I probably was not going to win this game, even though I said, I, right, he starts putting up really good defense. So I'm attacking his bishop and both of his pawns, but he's just defending everything, and now I start spending, uh, I start spending a little bit of, of time, right? I start spending more time, start giving him checks. I'm repeating the moves, because I don't know what to do. Uh, I should have probably caged in his king. Now, now he starts running with his pawn, you know, and he, and he stabilizes, and uh, we start shuffling our pieces because it's bullet, and uh, he's playing much faster than I am, and I'm still trying to push my pawns, but I still can't make any progress in the position, and um, this goes on for quite a while until I blunder my bishop. <laughs> so 
So I, 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 I thought, oh, Magnus is such a bum, I can take his bishop. Because uh, he pins his king and then they here. And um, I might have been able to still hold this very, very barely, but uh, yeah, I, that, that's, that's not what happened. And he ended up beating me on time in a crazy scramble, which I think lasted some 56 moves. And I lost some time. It's bullet, so you know, it happens. And, it's not really, let's say, impressive or, or unimpressive, but I've never had a chance to play him since, and I, I just, I, in the timeline of events of the last four years, this is a really funny game to me because it took me about three years to even think to make a video about this game. I made a video about this game November of 2020, so after Queen's Gambit. Like, I never even, in, in, my, in my wildest dreams, I was like, nobody really cares, it's like a bullet game, and it has five and a half million views, like people, and it's just like my only game against Magnus, and um, it, it's just kind of an analysis of this game. Uh, and that was also right around the time where I realized that YouTube chess content could, could really be a thing. Uh, and for me as a player, it, it's sort of a microcosm of, of myself as a chess player. And I don't know if any of you experience the same types of nerves, but I think because I set that early goal for myself to be an international master, uh, as opposed to, let's say, a grandmaster or, a, or just a stronger player, I have a a like really, really, really powerful uh, nervous system response against any of these top players. Like any time I play Magnus or, or just like any grandmaster, this weird respect sets in, and then this kind of like switch. You're gonna you're gonna play the game. You're gonna do really well for 20 moves, and then you're gonna mess it up. <laughs> and it's like you get a good position, and then what 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 is your brain telling you? Don't mess it up. It's gonna happen at some point, you start spending more time, you start doubting yourself a little bit more. And just like, I mean, in, in athletics, I mean in life, and in whatever, in chess, you can't really play like that. I mean, that's, that's, that's really not, you know, not, not super sustainable. Um, and, you know, I've played Hikaru many times as well. I have three games today. This is right around that time, September 2020. So I hadn't even made a video about that game. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, 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 the last game that I have is the one that I played recently in 2023. Um, 2020 was like the heyday of chess content. Out of curiosity, how many, just like show of hands, how many people got on this chess wave in 2020? Oh, not that, not that many, unless you're not raising your hand. How about what, like 2022, 2023? Okay, it's about the same, and one third doesn't quite raise their hands, unless it was even before 2020? Ah, very cool. I will tell you, I think of the folks that, that I've met like in New York or New Jersey or frankly anywhere, uh, a, a shocking amount of people uh, got in like, you know, 2020 and 2021. And this was the, uh, obviously 2022, 2023. This was um, right around that time. I mean, it was a crazy time. It was uh, six hours, eight hours on, you know, on Twitch. I would like cover, he covers tournaments and, you know, we would, we would do sub battles. And that was when um, there was, uh, Nothing else to do. I mean, we were basically under some form of, you know, lockdown. Uh, I mean, it was not. It was. It was six months into the whole thing, but it was just online content. I mean, people were watching streams. People were doing all this stuff. Um, and this game was uh, one of eleven games we played that day. The next ten keep me. Um, <laughs> but this game, I actually kind of held it together, which is uh, which is impressive for me as a chess player. Uh, and uh, I, I I don't know why this game gave me the GM title. Right? I kind of want to keep it, but I feel like just out of honor. Yes, I, I'm, I'm. I'm going to be correct. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to be inaccurate. I just realized that that was very nice to look at. The notes. <laughs> um, and I, you know, this game was. Uh, it, it was a. It was a Carl Con. It was. It was one of my favorite openings. I feel like Hikaru was like eating lunch during this game and talking to his community of like ten thousand viewers. Uh, but it counts, you know. So. Um, and I, 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 like I said, I played him probably in serious blitz games, maybe like 12 or 13 times. And I've had a few good games, but for the most part, I played against Steve Roll. He's one of the two best speed players in the world. Uh, in my opinion, my hot take is he's the second best chess player on the planet right now. Just all things considered, speed, classical, all the different success that he's having. Fabiano's up there too, uh, but uh, you, you, can't really, you can't really get past Magnus. Um, Hikaru played an exchange Karokan, and 
We played all stuff that's been seen before, right? This is all like chess opening theory or stuff that, that has been studied. He attacked my queen, I blocked and captured, and I'm pinned to my, my queen, which is slightly annoying, but you know, the good news for me is I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna go from here and block all of that, which is exactly what I did. Um, and then we castled on opposite sides. And so if you're gonna castle on opposite sides, you, you have to be ready uh, to go for some form of attack, generally with your pawns, right? That's, that's the easiest way, because normally your king is castled on this side, and th there is no easy way to create same side uh, attacking possibilities. Um, Hikaru went knight here, and so obviously, you know, you don't wanna double your pawns, right? That, that's like a big thing. Like, oh, I wanna get double pawns, I, I, I don't like double pawns. So one thing that I would tell everybody in this room is chess specific uh, is you really rarely want to evaluate anything with words. So you really rarely want to say, I don't like double pawns. No one cares. Like, not a person on, and, and the chess board also doesn't really, like it, it, that might very well be the best thing for black to do because double pawns don't matter right now. And what would matter instead is that one, you would have the open file to attack, which is nice. And two, your opponent would no longer have a dark squared bishop. So that's how you kind of have to think of things. So you're like, oh, wouldn't it be great if I could like get my knight there? Or wouldn't it be great if I could, you know, snipe on this diagonal? Or wouldn't it be great if somehow I could get to h2? So the hardest part of becoming a chess player is when you have all of those thoughts and then you put them all together correctly. That's the hardest part, right? Like that's, I could sit here and say, well, so, you know, superseding concepts, double pawns, and, but right now actually double pawns don't matter because you have, the hardest part is actually evaluating it in the game because you're going to sit here and you might try to implement that advice in your next tournament game and blunder your queen. And then it's like, well, why did I, you know, I, I thought I was, I, I was getting everything, uh, all of that in order, which is to say that I, I went here because I wanted him to take my knight. And considering the fact that he, his bishop was already standing very well, and he went here on purpose, he probably should have waited until I castled, right? But he was eating and talking to people and mildly <laughs> distracted and uh, you can't always play like a 3032. And I thought, and, and so he went back, which is like an admission that probably the bishop should have stayed there. And he didn't put it back there because, uh, you know, he kind of just like reconsidered, well, would I have played g5? Yes, attack, right? I would just keep going. And then if he goes here, this or this, you know, or, or this or, or bring my roots, right? He, he doesn't want to wave a flag in front of my, my attack. So he goes back, and uh, just like any good uh, queenside castling situation, always play king b8, or always play king b1, right? Shout out to Ben Feingold. You gotta defend your position here. And that wasn't actually a threat. It wasn't actually a threat because, let's say he had taken it, he would get stuck. Right, so be very careful wandering out here with your bishops, mostly for the, for the beginners in the room. You gotta, unless you have backup, Unless you've got this pawn to come help you, you don't. Because in this case, I'm just straight up attacking the bishop. Um, but I went here mostly just like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. Let me just make a, a preparation type thing. Also, I'm playing Hikaru. So, you know, when you play a really good player, sometimes you just do things that you probably wouldn't do against the strong, yeah, like a weaker player, you know. Uh, you play somebody 400 points higher, like, oh, I, I really got to just make sure everything's defended because I might just blunder something. Um, it's like, you know, it, it's not, it doesn't always have to apply that way. And he did the same thing. He actually probably felt a bit nervous about this diagonal. Uh, and then I went here, because I thought, me point bishop at king. <laughs> okay, me have three pawns to go to get to that point, but you know, I, maybe. Again, you know, it's like comfort. You feel nice moving a piece one square without blundering anywhere, right? I think we can all kind of agree. You know, even when you're an international master and you play the game for 20 years, <laughs> if I move the bishop here, it's safe. <laughs> oh, I'm so good, and that was his move. Generally, lose to players like Hikaru is. I get to a point. I'm like, I'm too afraid. Like, I'm too afraid of throwing a punch. You know, uh, I I make this analogy a lot, but I realize that of all the comparisons they make to chess, boxing is probably, or just fighting in general, is probably the most direct comparison. I've had like football players, baseball players, tennis players tell me, you know, they get into the zone with chess. Um, team sports is very difficult to compare to chess because. So many different players, so many different things, referees, right? I mean, like, they have an impact on the game. There's no chess ref that's just like blowing the whistle and throwing the flag. Uh, 
that, that doesn't really happen. Uh, but, it, but, in, but in fighting and in sports, a lot of it is like a matchup of styles. And if you throw a, a left, you know, if you're orthodox stance, throw a punch, right? And then the second you do this, the guy just cracks you so hard in the head. You're not gonna throw a punch again for a while. It's gonna take you a lot of courage to like build up that confidence. And the same in chess. You know, you're just like hesitant. You wanna keep everybody, everybody safe. Well, that person's gonna take the fight to you, right? So here, you know, knight d4. And, and generally this is like when, when, when I get overwhelmed, but I thought, you know what? Hikaru didn't have that bishop. I'm gonna go here. Cause I, I actually thought it was better for him to get this bishop rather than this bishop. Am I right? I don't know. I mean, I suppose we can turn on Slugfish, right? That's like the only way nowadays to know if you're right. Uh, what does it think about my move g6? It thinks I'm stupid and that, you know, white now has some advantage. It actually thought I should move the bishop back to where it was. Look at me. Stop, stupid, stupid, stupid. Go back, go back. Um, you know, like uh, preventing a toddler from walking off the table or something, which I did when I was two. Probably why I became a chess player. Um, <laughs> you're like, no, 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 please just, just stop it, stop it. There was no reason for the bishop to be there. But I went g6, and Kikoro went, uh, you know, he, he brought his bishop to safely guard the king. And, you know, the fascinating thing is, I'm pretty sure that was one of the top computers. What is the top, one of the top computer moves? The other one is actually starting at, how on earth do they know that? I would never, nobody in this room would play bishop g1. Not, not even me. I would never, I would never play bishop g1. What does bishop g1 even accomplish? Like, what are you even getting out of the way of? There's no knight move or pawn move that, that, that gets the bishop. Why on earth? Like it's, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm sitting here and I'm trying to explain it to you. The computer says, no, we need to go here to make sure everything is protected. And then, right, you start looking down that line. And one of the things when you analyze games with the engine is you have to know what you're capable of and what you're not capable of, right? If we flip the board, like, we're either taking the bishop because we just moved the knight there, but we're going a4, right? We know some things about opposite color, uh, opposite side castling. A4. This move, okay, I don't see a threat, so I would just play a4. Most people in this room would play a4, and some of you would, I don't know, blunder a piece, and that's okay. And, you know, if you wouldn't blunder a piece or play a4, you would probably say, well, b4. Just, you know, creating some sort of maybe queen up to, like, you know, get a queen or like, But all those moves make sense. It doesn't matter if Stockfish doesn't bless them. It's 3,700. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't understand how we think. Uh, and uh, that's fine. And I mean, he played bishop g1, which, like, it's a computer move, which is so absurd to me. Uh, and I went here, and luckily he didn't play, you know, top computer moves the whole game. He took, and I think he did that because he wanted this to be protected, right? So now I do this. Uh, I took with the knight because I wanted to just open up the lines here. Taking with the queen probably also was okay. And now I don't know what else I'm going to do in this position possibly. So h4, right? h4, pawn storm. I'm trying to play pawn to h3. This is almost one of those rare cases you wish they could just remove the pawn because then your rook would be much happier. Uh, and sometimes when you drive the pawn all the way, they go up and then you can't get the rook. So it's a very delicate process to figure out how to actually open up the file. And I realized how I wanted to open up the file. Uh, half pattern recognition, half creativity. I don't want to do it with the pawn, but I do want the pawn to disappear. So I want to take something. And you know, generally in chess, if you play moves like this, Nobody's going to take your bishop. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's not accurate. Maybe at some Elos they will. Uh, but uh, you need to play a move that's actually a little bit more forcing and not coach us, right? You need to play a move that's not, uh, well, if, it's actually a lot of the time how people think. They say, all right, so I'm going to play h3 because if takes, takes, I have a nice attack. Boink. And that is not how chess works. Uh, that is, you, you have that thought, now you have to start thinking, okay, what if they don't take? Not to mention, like, what if they ignore it completely? In this case, probably not recommended, because, you know, that's check. But we have to think, okay, that was my first idea. Now let's figure out why that doesn't work. And again, Stockfish might say, it very well could be the best move. So why does this not work? Okay, because G3. Now some of us at this point would say, ah, oh, sack. And then I'm gonna checkmate, and then you lose your queen. <laughs> Which is really, really tough. That is a tough pill to swallow. One move away from mate. It's like uh, it's like the famous painting. No, the, the thing, I, I always forget, on the Sistine Chapel. Uh, but, uh, and, and, I, and I should know, because I was at the Vatican this summer, uh, and I still forgot the name, stage fright. Uh, and this is uh, exactly how a lot of us play chess. 
get in there, H2, and then you hang your queen. Well, you don't hang your queen, but you know, there's gonna be another game where there's no mate. There's just no mate. And you gotta you gotta sometimes stop yourself from, from things that look good but don't actually have a purpose. However, the move that he caught him missed uh, was knight h5. And uh, he missed, he, like, he already saw it by the time I played it. Like, he, he basically played his move and went, oh, shoot, I gave him knight h5. And yeah, knight h5 comes with a check, which after takes takes is also just a brutal attack on the king. Uh, and now he started kind of, he started going, when Hikaru gets a bad position, he plays instantly. Like, all his moves are happening really fast because he's a really annoying defender. And so now I have to not panic. I take on Passant, right, because he's forced, and then knight b5, and I'm like, oh my god, he carves counter attack me. If I was playing a 2400 here, do you know the amount of vile trash talk I would be de delivering upon this poor soul? <laughs> and like, if any of you were playing somebody 200 points lower than me, you'd be like, because I wouldn't see my queen as hanging. Like, what a buffoon. But then if you were playing your friend who's 300 points, oh my god, counterplay! How did I allow that? Oh my goodness, I have to move my queen now and I have to survive. Showed you a situation where there was a main threat and you lost your queen. So what is the difference? The difference is you very, very quickly look. Can my opponent pose any threats to me? That also stopped the main. Not really. Like there is a fork, but then it's main. So really you have to deal with this. And that's what I calculated. Then he went here, and then here I still was mildly unpleasant because I was like, trust me, I really wanted to win that knight back, just safely get my investment back, because he just took my bishop. I think there's something here. Always look for checks. And I realized that after check, he has to lose his queen. It's made otherwise. He has to go here. And then I take his queen. And I thought, I'm going to beat Hikaru. Oh my god, no way. And sometimes the position is good enough. There's nothing the nerves can even do. But you still have to be precise. So he went this way, right? Now if we count the material, he has two bishops for a queen which is losing, but it's not like completely hopeless. Um, and I, I wanted to just depart the position and you know, not to those squares, because that would be really sad. Uh, but uh, you know, so I'm like F4 and then just try to, but trust, oh my God, the heart rate at this point goes from like, whatever your resting heart rate is to times four. Uh, and, uh, and, and, but then I realized I, uh, I have something here. I have this move, rook takes H2, actually sacrificing the rook. So it's unintentional, but, uh, and now there is a pin, which I just showed you, but there is a major difference here. Because now I have backup, and that is made. And I thought this was it. I thought the game was over here. Then he went here, and I was like, oh my god, I missed something. I can't take the rook, and I can't take the bishop. I'm still winning, but I'm taking Hikaru, so, you know, again, you're like, oh my god, I've ruined everything again. And then just like, just like it always happens, I can't actually take my queen. Um, and I can't take his rook, though, so I thought, Sack the rogue again, and then like take the pawn, and nope. What is the most pressing matter in this position? It is this. So you can move your king, or you can do this. And now I know the you know the moves are here. So if this was a chess lesson, this would be a very bad chess lesson. But the game ended in style because he tried to kick me out, attacking my queen twice. That's kind of a phantom threat, and I did this, and uh, that was pretty cool because he can take my queen, but then he gets checkmated with my rook and my knight. And he can like try to play more defense, but I just take the bishop at that point. With either piece, I can sack the queen, or I can take with the rook. If I take with the rook, I can actually choose my checkmate, which is also kind of funny. <laughs> like, and somehow, all the stars aligned in this game, and, uh, and I, I managed to keep my nerves. I mean, the time gap was, like you see, every, every move he's playing in one second. Like, from all the way back here, Two seconds, one second. He's not even thinking because he he knows he has to he has to defend, and I'm the one who has to spend six seconds, eight seconds, right? Panicking. Ninety-five. Like at this point, I spent nine seconds because I thought I ruined everything, and then I went here, and I was like, oh my god. Knight takes f3, and uh, it's just unstoppable checkmate. And this was uh, the, well, the, this is the best chess player that I've ever managed to beat in a game. Uh, but I, it, you know, it's it's I, 
games like this, I kind of sit back and I just go, oh wow, I actually can do this thing pretty well because in 2020, 2021, I tried to go back to competitive chess. And some of you might have followed some of those videos. I was training a lot. Um, I, was, I was playing in tournaments. I was making recaps of my own games. And it was brutal. First of all, one of the most, how much time do we have? One of the most, one of the most uh, underappreciated elements of the last three years is the amount of information that is now out in the chess world. Like, a lot of you here who are experienced tournament players might use books or something like Chessable, uh, which, uh, which is a very, very, in my opinion, like an intermediate advanced way to learn chess. I mean, you have some of the best players in the world making courses and like releasing their analysis. And then there's a category of players that play mostly online, they're like mostly hobby players, they might play against their friends, uh, they might study in a slightly different way because studying for tournaments is very, very different than studying, you know, just to play for fun, just to have some openings under your belt. But uh, the average, like, 10, 11 year old strong chess player nowadays has a better opening repertoire than, like, most people in the 20th century, like, even the best players. Like, they could probably beat them in 20 moves just purely on prep, just memorizing various silly defenses. And that's, it's, it's mind blowing. All of this time we spent indoors for the last two years, the best players in the world were playing online. They were playing weekly events, they were playing events uh, that were, let's say, uh, you know, once every month, like in all these tours, the Champions Chess Tour that, that was happening, the, the Magnus events where he was playing all the time, and so much information, so many openings were discovered, so many ideas were discovered. And a lot of you were the benefactors of that, but so are they, like they're, they're playing ideas all the time. And it was a huge struggle for me because when I tried to become an international master, uh, chess was like a full-time study job. I mean, I studied seven days a week and probably like 30 hours, 40 hours total while also finishing college uh, and then also uh, teaching, teaching 500. So not like using anything that I'm studying. I'm studying all this like deep analysis and then I go and I have to, you know, come a 500 like a wonder that's the best known thing in the world and like why you should play it and it's so easy and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, you know, do your tactics and do your own work and all that stuff. And it was hard. I mean, I discovered over the last few years that uh, I, I, I put such a ridiculous amount of pressure on myself in these tournaments and I wish I could just not do that, you know, uh, but uh, it's, not, it's not that easy. It's uh, the same as taking an important college exam or you have a game day. I don't know if you know, any of you are athletes or chess or anything. And it's, a, it's an eternal kind of uh, battle against yourself. Like to me, I am, I, I am my, my biggest opponent by far. I am hardly playing the people in front of me unless they're 11, in which case, yeah, that, yeah we're definitely battling and they're probably getting the upper hand. Um, <laughs> I famously talk about a tournament in St. Louis, which I played October, I think it was 2021. I played the number four, number two, and number one ranked 11 year olds in the United States. <laughs> it was like the gym leaders of Pokemon. It was, <laughs> it was so brutal. Uh, round one was kind of crazy because in round one, I played the number four uh, 11 year old, and he never in his life, he played E4, he played the King's Pawn, uh, just like Hikaru in this game. And, and I played Karo Kondo, and I saw, oh, easy game, I'm not even gonna prep. He plays E4, he doesn't know anything about the Karo thing, he doesn't have a good weapon against it, he loses all the time. I showed up, he played the London. And he played the London, because it's easy to play, but he also played the London, like, completely perfectly. I got nothing, and you know, I'm, I'm like, trying to win the game, because I'm a higher rated player, I can't, I just can't, he's a brick wall. And then I give him the advantage, because I'm trying to win so much, and we still managed to make a draw, because I was, you know, 350 points higher rated, so he was just also happy to draw against me. The wildest part about that game is that two years earlier, we were both in Weifang, China for the World Cadet Championship, which is the World Under 8, World Under 10, World Under 12. I didn't coach him. He had a different coach. I was coaching a handful of other kids. I was selected by US Chess to like, you know, go with the team. Going to Weifang, China is like coming to America on vacation and going to South Dakota. Like it's literally, people in China did not know Weifang existed. China's massive, but I would tell people in advance that I was going to Wei Fang, uh, and they and they would go, "What's that? Like, what are you talking? That's not a." Weifang. And then we would go to Wikipedia and we would look up Wei Fang. It has no history. The history <laughs> section is blank. That was weird. Uh, apparently, it's the they, they fly kites. It's like the, the the kite flying capital of China. And to get there, I had to fly to Beijing, then to Qingdao, like the like the pier. Had it, and 
then drive two and a half hours west into God knows where. I don't know where it was. Um, all I know is I was picked up from the airport. Uh, very nice, uh, very nice Chinese man. And, and, and what I like there is they they talk they uh, talk into an app that immediately translates. Like you don't have to. So he he picked me up. He was like, uh, "You're going to Weifang?" I was like, "Yes." And then he went, "Do you smoke?" <laughs> And he was, and I was like, no. He's like, do you mind if I smoke in the car? I was like, no, it's your car. Please go ahead. And that was our whole interaction. Then we drove two hours to Weifang, and uh, then I got out and, and I saw, you know, our fellow players. And this kid was there. He was in the world under ten. He was like, I don't know, 1600, just a couple of years prior. And now this dude is like 2300. This game happened. My game. What I'm talking about happened a few years ago. He's like 2300. Obviously, he's 13 now. But all these kids are just monsters. Like they're all so 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 good now. And um, it's very tough to play against them. It, I mean, it's, they're, they're so strong. I've, I've never, the only way as an adult to now get your titles, like Grandmaster, International Master, all these things, is just go to Europe. And in Europe, what they do is they play one game every day at 3 p.m. So you can you know, play your game, have a dinner, go out, fall asleep on the beach, come back, do a little prep, meet up like a, you know, another fellow 20 or 30 year old who's in Europe to avoid the 10 year old prodigies. Uh, until recently, they all found their way there too. So now all those tournaments uh, are, are like filled with just talented kids, 10, 11, 12 years old. It, it, it is really, it is quite surreal. Um, and to me, I'm sure that this game, uh, this last game was just sort of a, a culmination of me maybe getting over my, my nerves a little bit. Um, for, for me, the most fascinating thing is I was sitting in, in my hotel room in St. Louis, like on the verge of crying. I was like, this 11 year old won't remember this game happened in three days. <laughs> really, like three, three, maybe a week. Like, he probably doesn't remember it happened now. Uh, and that, that 11 year old at the time, he's, I guess, soon to be 13 now, uh, Ryo Chen, he was like 2400. And chess is one of these kind of endeavors where uh, I worked for that one game in St. Louis that I lost. Not the game that I just described, which was a draw, but sort of the end of the tournament. Um, I prepared for like two months. I was working with a coach. I, I'm uncoachable because uh, my parents split up when I was very young, so it was very individualistic. Like I would not listen to anybody. So I never had a coach. I, they tried, I would just not do the homework. I was like, no, I'm gonna teach myself. Which is not really good. The parents like make sure the kids have like a good coach because you know when you're like 11, you can't make your own decisions super properly when it comes to your own training. Like you should probably have a coach uh, who is telling you what to do. And my parents are like, all right, we don't know anything about chess, so we're just gonna let them do this thing. And I had a coach and everything. I was like working super hard and I was preparing, prepared for this tournament for like a month. And I saw that this 11 year old who I was about to, you know, destroy in chess played like the King's Indian defense. And I was gonna play something that I had been practicing on my anonymous account, 50 practice games. And I had a good score and I knew all the lines and we sat down and I've never played this opening publicly. You could never research and find that unless you knew my anonymous account. And I played all of my prep, like 13 memorized moves, he deviated, I responded accurately. I'm up like 45 minutes on the clock. I'm walking around like, nice, this is it right here. Like this is everything you work for, you put in all the work. And then slowly, I was making dinner plans. Like I told Eric Rosen, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna try to win fast because I was in St. Louis, we're gonna go play tennis now. So we're gonna play on like, jinx it. You know, probably, probably shouldn't have done that. Put in all that work and, uh, and, I, and I get back and this kid just starts putting up this resilient I'm like slowly converting my advantage, and I make a move, I press the clock, and all chess players know this kid's window. Can you, can you play that? I didn't even think of that. Whatever, I'm still better, but you know, man, I, I gotta be a little bit more careful. Like that move, come on. Plays it immediately. Like doesn't even think, like he caro level. Like what? That's like a really complicated move. How is he just trusting that it's the best move? So I sit down, I take 20 minutes, I go, all right, I worked everything out. I make a move. What about this other defensive move? What is happening? Plays that move instantly too. He wasn't even at the board. Like, dude made his move, was just hopping around. Like, the thing about playing in like barrels is as you play, they don't sit at the board. Any of you know this? You play kids, they're like hopping, like in the play hall, you know? They're like, they're, they'll stand here and just go, you know, like, they'll, like they're, you know, they're like intimidating you. But, the, but another thing about the worst thing that chess players do, they go to your side and they look at the board from your side. Oh, that's like, whew. I mean, you can, you can do whatever you want. Um, 
And like, you know, I played eight and nine-year-olds that lick their fingers after eating snacks at the board. <laughs> I'm like, that's gross. Oh my God. Uh, and it's, it's just, you know, they're, they're 11. Like, they have some of that energy, but they're also destroying you at a fully cerebral activity. And there is nothing more humbling than, you know, than that moment. I'm sitting there going, I prepared for months to get exactly what I wanted in this game. And I'm throwing it all away. And the worst part is there is a dancing 11 year old. Like, I'm thinking, <laughs> if he busted out a Fortnite dance, I would have left. <laughs> and slowly but surely, I lost and completely unraveled psychologically. And that, that happened to me again in a more recent tournament, and I like, kind of decided I can't keep doing this to myself. It's literally the definition of insanity. You do the same thing over and over, but expect a different result. So one day I will. You know, I will probably return to competitive chess because my mom is actually my number one believer. She thinks I can be a grandmaster and I have to become a grandmaster because it'll like finish this whole lifelong journey. I don't think I'm mentally prepared yet. But recently, you know, I managed to be the number one ranked player in the world in speed chess, which I think, you know, says, says something who actually played my opening, you know, against me. And in this game, I, I did manage to kind of keep, you know, keep it all together. Um, I played a, a fantasy Carl Khan, opening not super important, Alirez of Perugia, youngest ever 2800, beat Magnus's record. So he became 2800 fide at like 18 and a little bit. Uh, very eccentric though, because then he started talking about having a career as a fashion designer. <laughs> it's probably because he moved to Paris. But like, we gotta have more money in chess. Why is he talking about being a fashion designer? Like, you know, he's like, he's a superstar. He's like the Alcaraz of chess. And it's, it, yeah, it's unbelievable. We gotta, we gotta get these guys somehow more sponsorships and everything. Um, game was equal, we traded a bunch of center pawns, and at some point when I play really good players, like I said, one of two things happen. I start tremendously doubting myself, uh, and I get really low on time, I, I start hesitating, and I lose. In this game, that was sort of happening right here. He started attacking me. You can kind of see, like, you know, I'm being very defensive. Uh, I'm like, I'm, I'm allowing him, like, look at how much time I spend on moving my queen one square. So just like, good rule of thumb, if you have 121 on the clock, yeah, don't spend 34 seconds doing that. <laughs> I was just nervous, like, uh, that, that's really all it is, I mean, I know his plan, and I was thinking, you know, do I go here, or do I let him go here? Well, very similar to the Nicky Carl game, right, except there was no rook. <laughs> but like I said, attacking the same side is difficult. Um, queen here, and then I realized I made a mistake. I, I completely forgot he could take it. Just forgot. I forgot it, and I, I thought, oh, he just does this. But luckily, my move that I spent some 30 seconds on, uh, I realized, oh, you know what? I, I actually have some attacking possibilities. I can put my knight there, defend it by my queen, gets the rook, and then what's after that? This pawn. Right? So you always have to think, what's only defended by a king? And this is going to open up in the future. Bishops are having a staring contest. So a lot of peace interactions here, right? So when I played my g5, I started getting a little bit confident. And right here I realized uh, I might be able to force a draw or win. And it's just, in, in general, forcing a draw is maybe not something everybody wants, but against Perugia, I'll take it. Like, if that's the floor, yeah, let's go for it. And I, I just realized I, I have this one. And it's very difficult for him to stop himself from getting checkmated. I just have to do something about the knight coming back. Because I realized this move severely weakens the king too. So I went takes, 15 seconds, I have 20 seconds left on the clock. There's one second bonus time, but then I went here. And I thought, very simple, I take. I sacrifice the rook, that is literally my only skill in life. So, <laughs> I take step six. And then here, and then mate. Well, that's pretty easy, I've done enough puzzles. And then I realized if on the g6, he doesn't have enough defenses. And again, when you're trying to attack, when you're trying to determine whether you can sacrifice, I always use the rule of plus two. Two more attacking pieces than he has defenders. One, two, three, four. This is an attacker because he's got, you know, he hasn't even moved these two pieces. Right? So I thought, oh, this is over. Rook takes, rook takes, queen here. It's just game over. This, made. This, made. This, made. That's pretty easy to calculate. Okay. Rook takes f7. But I realized it's not checkers. He doesn't have to take me. He has this move, right, which is a nice counterattack. But I just prepared myself to take the bishop, and I have two pawns, 
And I have nine seconds. <laughs> so at this point, I could barely make a move. Like, I, I, I my hand was shaking, and I, I was fully prepared to lose this game and talk about how the day that I almost beat Bruce. Um, he went here, and I saw my pawns were, you know, on the left side. They're, they're, they're hanging. But if I move my pawn, then he's going to take my bishop. I can maybe take his knight with my bishop, but then, you know, again, I thought, I'm losing attackers. Yes, I can win a pawn, but I'm losing attackers. I can't just checkmate him with a queen and a knight. Um, and I just decided to play rook f1. And he went rook here, and I played knight takes. I have three seconds on the clock at this point. <laughs> like, I'm barely getting these moves up. The nervous system overload of, oh my god, what's he going to do, what's he going to do, what's he going to do? And I, like, I have to be ready. I have to make some moves. So he plays here. I play knight f4. I play this move with, this move I played with 1.6 or 1.7 seconds on the clock. So I played it with 0.7. Like literally, you know, handshaking, and then you just get it there, and you like hope you didn't do anything wrong. And then he attacked my queen, also with one second on the clock, but he's also like again 3,200 bullet. And I played this move with 0.1 seconds, and I remember that because when I analyzed the game, I had 1.1 when this move happened, uh, and uh, I pinned you know the rook to the king, and then I can take. But sometimes when you have a little time, a check feels nicer. So I went here, and at this point I realized we're gonna have to repeat moves probably. Because, you know, king here, I don't know, I don't have, maybe I could do something else. Uh, I, had, I, I do have a winning idea, which is to sacrifice the queen, which is kind of nice, which I did not see in one second. And now I can play this. So it's discover check, I win the queen, and yes, he can win it back, but hopefully we can win an end game up three pawns. There's really not much else to this. You just go there and push, right? Bring your king and, and push everybody. Didn't see that. Thought I had to repeat moves. And fortunately, he also did not want to bring his king back to danger, so he walked his king to a board. And sometimes that happens, right? He missed the forest for the trees. Maybe if he had gone back to g8, I would have repeated and then I would have found that tactic, but we'll never know. And this is what I saw coming from like a mile away. And uh, he could try to play for a wing here on time, but with the bonus time, it's basically impossible. I'll just give him a bunch of checks, get like to five seconds, and that I will manage to win. Um, and you know what's funny in games like this is they don't even feel good to me anymore. They just feel like, wow, I avoided another throw. Uh, and I, but uh, I've only, um, I've only had, you know, I, I, I get to experience this like once every couple of weeks. But uh, but you know, it's just like a, for me, it's it's a lifelong journey because I'm I'm split, right? I'm I'm a content creator. I'm, I'm I guess I'm I'm a chess entertainer. Like I'm strong enough to dig, uh, to break down games when Ferruja or Hikaru or Magnus play in the tournament, and I can talk about it to all of you in a way that not just makes sense, but like makes you care because that's really why we a lot of us watch anything live and competitive and in the first place. Uh, but the other part of this journey is like this is 2023, so it's been. It's been five years. I played Magnus when I didn't even know this was going to be for my career. I played Hikaru a lot of the times when it was just in the in the in the thick of things, like for a year straight. Two YouTube videos. I was waking up at eight. I was doing. Uh, I was streaming until let's say one. I would take. I would have lunch. I would record a video to come out at seven p.m. And like Lucy and I would just hang out for a little bit, watch a show, something, and then at eleven I would go back to my office and record a video at eleven p.m. twelve o'clock to release 7 a.m. the next day. And this was my life during that, you know, Hikaru game for, I don't know, eight months, 10 months at this point. And, and it, is, uh, it is fascinating to kind of see how, how far the whole thing has come. Um, I'm like super excited now to be able to get out to, to, to meet people. And uh, for me, it's when people say, okay, biggest chess channel, I'm like, yeah, but that's like, that's you guys. Like that, that number comes from somewhere. It's from the people who are watching. It's from the people who are, uh, tuning in, I don't stream that much anymore, but it was the people that were, you know, tuning into the streams and sending videos to their friends, shorts, you know, long form content. Yes, the email, which will return, it hasn't been, you know, have a new episode in, in two months or something like that. But uh, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm super thankful and uh, it's, it's super uh, cool to be able to kind of do one of these in person things at, at this magnitude. We're kind of going up. The first one was 250, then it was 330. This is like maybe five or six hundred, and I don't know. I don't know if we'll ever get to T Swift level where I'll have to <laughs> be transported out in a cleaning cart. Um, but I think it's uh, it's a good time to, to turn it over to um, Q and A of some sort. I don't know how we do this. If people have microphones or.
you want to yell, I can. Yeah, so what we're going to do, we're going to push laptops out. Um, this one, is, we're going to put this up for like a minute or two. Um, cool. This is a QR code that you can scan. Um, also a code, and you can put questions in there. After like a minute, we'll move it over to a different screen, and all of them will populate. Very exciting and slightly complex for me. Reading a chat. How do I what? When you have like videos and you're streaming, uh -huh. people are like commenting every single like microsecond. How do you like? Uh, on my stream? Yeah. How do I? The question is, how do I catch comments when I'm streaming? Um, well, I definitely don't don't catch all of them. Uh, I uh, I think it's like overactive brain. So after two three hours, I'm just really tired. <laughs> it's probably not like the healthiest thing. Um, but I don't know. That's kind of what being a streamer is, right? I like yeah, yeah. to uh, you know respond to chat questions and people saying all sorts of crazy things to you. Which is sort of what We already went through it. Uh, like, like, if you're in the I think they're all coming from Yeah. Intending to click on the most ego-boosting question first, but I was just 
Um, how often do I get recognized publicly? Uh, if I spend like, so New York City is really big. We live in like a, a, a more quiet pocket. Um, it, it, just if I like hung out there for a week and didn't really go anywhere, uh, walking the dog or something like that, may, maybe once during that week. And it's generally by somebody who's like 20 or 25. One of the things that I get, my, my biggest um, criticism is I make a lot of content for like teenagers and children because it's like loud and exciting and you know, you have to play to the YouTube algorithm so you have to look like a complete clown in all of your thumbnails, which unfortunately is the reality, but you know, that's how you grow your channel sometimes. Uh, but actually like the average age of people that come up to me is like 25. So it, that, that actually is quite, quite interesting. But um, in Manhattan, like there have been days uh, at the US Open, for example, I went to, to the US Open for tennis, just in the stadium that was five times. And those days, I'm, I'm actually just stunned. Because it's everybody, it's kids, it's, it's adults, it's teenagers, and people just go, dude, God, I'm like, I love yourself, can we take a photo? Super cool, I like, I, I do not mind at all. Uh, if for whatever reason we see each other, if I'm in Gainesville again, or if you somehow find your way to New York and you see me, please say hello. Uh, do not ask me to, to yell sacrifice the road for video, and uh, do not ask me to uh, play on your physical chess set. So there was a, at the Metropolitan Museum, there was two tourists, and they saw me and they said, oh no, I have a chess set in my bag, you want to play a game? And I was like, no, I'm with my family. Like, with this. But uh, you know, we can like, talk and everything, but I was like, no, please. Uh, but hey, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's nothing, but uh, sometimes it's five or six in a day, which, uh, you know where I was recognized the most? Toronto. If any of you have been to Toronto, super young city, like a lot of students, a lot of young professionals, and I was there for the Global Chess Championship last year. People were yelling at me from their cars. It was it was kind of wild. They 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 really love chess there, so I'm excited to go back. Uh, it, it's uh, it's happening again in, in December. So okay, there's a box. Ah, this box. Cool. Um, let's see. Everyone say the rook. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh, this is a brutal spelling of Conor McGregor. <laughs> oh, goodness me. I'm so uh, I'm very sorry. Uh, I did not mean to say Conor McGregor wrote this. So it's one N, and it's McGregor with an O, and one G, I think. Uh, yeah, this question never really uh, works because I think the bar for Conor is not getting checkmated which I think he can learn in, you know, a few minutes, and he will knock me out in, I would say, one punch. <laughs> maybe two, like, maybe I can cover up with, you know, uh, like, he'll, you know, the same thing with, like, you know, Mike Tyson versus Magnus, who would, like, Mike Tyson, he'll kill him. <laughs> like, he just has to, but if he doesn't, you know, he could go in, and then he could, um, you know, maybe he'll, uh, he can survive or something, but, uh, is this gonna be what's my favorite cheese? <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Thought provoking on this indeed. Um, that's a good question. Pepper check? Yeah. 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 Alright, pepper check. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Let's go. Oh, my goodness. Wow, I didn't think you were going to ask me a question here. Do you have your statistics degree influence uh, your training or play in general? Oh, that's a serious question, but unfortunately, not at all. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I don't really, I mean, I, you, you have to look at stats sometimes in chess. I mean, what has a good win rate, what has a good, you know, this and that, but I don't think you need a degree for that. Um, but I will say, I have lessons that I learned from college. I went to a, I went to a city university in New York, so a lot of it was like, uh, you know, networking sessions, and you know, you would go, there would be like a banker from, from J.P. Morgan, and there would be 30 people waiting in line to talk to that person. And I, I, I was always really put off by stuff like that. But I, I, my biggest regret from college is just not networking a little bit more. I don't, I don't have a single friend or contact from four years of university. Not by deliberate choice. I just went to a school in, in, a, in a major city where you, know, you would commute to school and then you would commute home. There was really no on-campus housing, which I know is completely different here. Here I was two miles away from my destination yesterday and I saw University of Florida. Like some campus wing. This place is gigantic. You know, and driving through, like, it'd be kind of nice to just be, like, incubated in the space like this for four years. So don't take it for granted, okay? Because not everybody becomes the chess YouTuber with some 
millions of subscribers. Like, if I if I was just a chess teacher, it would probably be okay. But without having that, uh, you know, that's yeah. I mean, like, you, you gotta you gotta get put in put in the hours. You have to you have to go to these events and, and the network that you make from school is uh, this looks like a really good school. The network that you make from school is invaluable. Were you a dancing eleven year old player when you played? Um, yeah, I was an awful kid. Uh, that was my parents' fault primarily. And, you know, 30% of the blame falls on my shoulders. Um, yeah, I was really bad. Uh, I was kicked out of a chess camp by one of the best chess players of all time. So, Artur Yusupov, if any of you look him up, at some point was rated like number three in the world. And number two was Karpov. Number one was Kasparov. Dude knew how to play chess. Also, dude knew how to write books. He has a great series for intermediate advanced players that are, you know, like workbooks. They're not colorful and pretty like the book I made for, you know, new and improving players. They're very serious books, which is kind of how you have to learn chess. Yeah, I like was misbehaving in his classes all the time. I would yell out the answers. He would kind of stop yelling at the answers. So I would make another kid yell at the answers. I would like <laughs> tell the answer to that kid. And then I would, uh, and one, yeah, one, one summer he was like, look, it's him or me. They chose him. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, this was, you know, I, like I said, I, I was very tough to teach, so I was fortunate that I loved the game so much that I would play and learn and everything. Uh, but at the board, I actually was more adult. So I think when I had to be in a setting where something was, you know, like, like I was not terrible on a plane, I was not terrible in certain situations, I was mostly terrible, like, among peers. But here, no, 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 this was like, this was it for me. Like, I, I, I the focus got turned up to, uh, you know, to, uh, to a thousand. When I, uh, I'm really scared of this question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have this one. Come on, guys. It's the average SAT score of this college. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a bad question to have. I don't know. But uh, what is the most effective way to use the system to make your game more dangerous? You know, I thought this system would like be good for weeding out some of the sillier stuff, but it's definitely pushing it to the top. Um, don't have anything profound to say. You know, I, I, I think I'll give you a corporate answer. I'll circle back, you know, when I, when I hand out some, some development here. And, uh, I mean, I, I, I'm, if the roof sacrificed me, then that would certainly be tragic. I, uh, I, I, we have many roofs to sacrifice, but if they sacrificed us, then why are you so What? Gator Chomp. Gator Chomp. Gator Chomp. Right over yeah, yeah. Is this is, is this like the, the thing we do at like football games? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right over left. Right over left. Right over left. Right over left. Yeah. Right over left. Yeah. No. 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 Too <laughs> straight. Too Getting drinks with you, I have a plane tonight, and I have to drive to the plane. Um, my dad plays, I don't like Shang Chi, right? The Chinese version of chess, uh, is it more aggressive? Uh, why have they not? Oh, yeah, this is, a, this is a good question. I mean, it's like the same thing. In Japan, they play shogi a lot, they almost don't play chess at all. Uh, and uh, I've never played. I've never played Chinese chess, but I know it's extremely popular in China to the point that like Daily Ren winning the World Chess Championship from China, I thought it was going to be huge, absolutely huge, more than a billion people. Also, they really, really love to back athletes and people who win. It's like what my wife tells me, and she, um, like we were, we're big mixed martial arts fans, so they they love Sean Wei Li, who's a, a UFC champion there. Uh, and I thought that's it, Daily Ren winning, that's going to be amazing. I've even invited Daily Ren to do a podcast together. My wife can translate, and I mean, I could ask him questions. You know, like some of these players are more comfortable in their native language than when they have to speak English. He like can't reach the guy. I don't know, I don't know why, but there's just not a whole lot of buzz uh, in, in in China for chess specifically. And I mean, obviously, when something is so hyper uh, focused, like let's say Chinese chess in China, it's going to be huge there. But the same effect, it's going to be difficult to to turn it back around. The same way, like anybody play shogi, I've never played shogi. Some people try shogi. I can't play other games. 
because I, I want to be really good. I hate being really bad at games. So I can't play show game because I'm like, I'm terrible. And then I have, you know, I get really obsessed and addicted. And, um, how would I recommend? Let's see if this ends in a serious way or in a gator challenge. Oh, this is a good question. How would you recommend it from 1500 to 2000? Uh, whoever asked this question, uh, online or in person? In person, <laughs> ah, very different, yes. Um, so uh, what I would say is, no, it's definitely not possible in tactics alone, definitely not. People at like 18, 1900, they're buying the courses, they're studying the stuff. Admittedly, you get them one move out of their comfort zone, poop their pants. Like they'll <laughs> immediately lose. Uh, and I have a really close friend that's currently playing in a chess tournament, and he just two, two games in a row yesterday did the exact same thing. Like, love this guy, but he played 12 moves of prep that he and his coach, you know, put together. One move that he had to find on his own, he thought, for like 20 minutes, lost the game on the spot. So you have to play to your style, you know? If you want to, you need to think, okay, if I'm playing an 1800, and they play Sicilian, they obviously study something for hours and hours. So you have two choices. Go into that something find, you know, your way around it, or play something that they might not be as prepared for, which is still reputable, it's not like some crazy gambit, which is, you know, all in or something like that, but uh, a 1500 with no openings will lose to an 1800 with openings, let's say 90 to 95% of the time, there's exceptions, there's probably people in the room right now, they're like, I'm 1800, I don't, I don't know, I can't even sit with single openings, and I never thought of the Roman Empire, like I can't, <laughs> and I just, I just never do those things, you know, so uh, it, it, it is possible. I got to like 18, 1900, admittedly I was 10, so it's different when you study chess as a hyper-obsessed child that just plays Blitz online all the time. I had to, I had to study openings when I was 1900, 2000, and I've had to study openings ever since. Like to get from uh, 2000 to 2300, I had to learn, let's say, Trumpowski, which was just such a rude awakening for people that studied hundreds of hours of different openings, because when you play like certain openings with black, you're like, Study. My coach has shown me this. Move to you're on your own, and that's like when people struggle, and then you know you'll you'll know. But it's a balance, you know. It's a balance, and you have to figure out what you're what you're good and bad. Like I know what I'm good and bad. I just don't really have the time or patience or energy at the moment to solve it. And you have to self-diagnose a lot. Bad in medicine, good in chess to know what you're good and bad at. Um, how much do I bench? Good question. Uh, I would like to think I'm not like the weakest chess player. Um, I, I weigh 160 when I'm healthy, and when I'm not healthy, I weigh like 170. So right now we're on the healthier side because I've also been uh, boxing. Can't just be a chess player and a streamer because uh, it's just not a very healthy lifestyle. Uh, mm -hmm. I uh, I can bench right now probably like 135, 145 consistently, but you know, I'm, you know I bench my body weight. I can squat my body weight. You're supposed to do like way more than that, but. You know, I can't, I can't get too big muscles because then I can't move them when I'm boxing. That's my excuse. So, uh, I have a friend who can, who's my height, my weight. He could bench uh, 225. He's very proud of it. So I hear that's a really big accomplishment. 225 and you have, uh, what's that, two plates? That's a, that's, a, that's a big deal to be able to bench that much. So, uh, I will never get there. But, uh, you know, I'd like to think if I chess box a chess player, I think I, think I, could, uh, I, I could do a good job, but I probably won't. Um, let's see. I feel like I'm, I've missed some of these. I'm scared of some of these. If I played Magnus 10,000 times with my amazing opening, best in the world, can't remember how many times can I beat him? Um, it was a good question. No, you can't scholars man. It's not, I mean, it depends how many alcoholic beverage, juice, juice, how much juice he drinks <laughs> until he has to go to the bathroom a lot and lose all the time. Um, so, uh, no, you, you, I, th I actually think, this is like a fun thing, if somebody here played Magnus 10,000 times, like I don't think you would even win one game. There's no, the margin of error is very different, I think, in athletics. Like, you could score a penalty on one of the best goalkeepers in the world. I think the variance there is very different than in chess. But then you got to consider other factors. Is it 10,000 games in a row? Yeah. <laughs> Probably. I mean, I'm assuming you'll faint or <laughs> fall asleep. <laughs> you, know, you, might, you might win a game on time. So. I've only played it once, and I, uh, I lost it, but how did Duolingo get in your apartment? <laughs> um, that, was a, that was a fun thing. I, I wanted to work with Duolingo for a minute, because I, I really like what they do on social media. I'm sure many of you have seen Duolingo Owl doing all sorts of stupid stuff, fun stuff. Uh, and I, I wish I was that brave. 
You know, we watch these like people on the streets and they're just like, sir, for a dollar, name a woman. And it's like, oh my, I could never. I, am, I like to think I'm extroverted, but I have a cap. I'm like an introverted extrovert or an antisocial extrovert. Like I, like Kendrick Lamar said, you know, I, um, I have like a, a, a window of time I can talk and then I'm dead. So this drive home to Jacksonville and getting on the plane is going to be really nice. I'm listen to some music or a podcast, like I'm going to, you know, but uh, yeah, I cannot do that type of stuff. And I was really impressed with what, what they managed to do. And they said, do you want to do like a little thing with us? Because we're doing this chess.com collab, which is a no brainer to me because chess is so international. And they showed up to my house. And let me tell you, the bird is like double the width of this. It is <laughs> so huge. And, uh, and and there was just a person in the bird. And then, <laughs> and then the person, so it wasn't Lucy, that was a crazy theory. Uh, yeah, the person was just there, and then and then they left. It was, you know, they were in the apartment for like 10, 15 minutes. And then uh, they, they had to, they could barely fit through the hallways because the apartment was moving. And um, then I went to their office a little bit later in the day to film some in-person stuff. And what I didn't realize is the bird is not soft. So if any of you saw, you was seen on their socials, you can go look, there's a thing. Is somebody doing to a window? A sound. Um, we played a chess game with the Duolingo owl, and uh, it was supposed to like rage, you know, like slammed his head, and then it, you know, threw a piece around him. He headbutted me. <laughs> it's not visible on camera, because the angle that she had it literally didn't have me at all. And the owl came crashing down on my nose. <laughs> It was a whole thing. And, uh, none of that is visible, and I am not suing them. Uh, they, uh, they, they were like, oh my god, are they broken? You know, we'll pay for the glasses. I should say yes. But uh, they were sadly not broken. It wasn't that bad, but it's it's enormous. It's like this big, and then having it descend upon you. And smash it. I didn't realize how big it was. Like, I thought, oh, it's just going to hit the board, and then it went right here. So, you know, maybe I'm not a very good chess boxer if I can't gauge the distance. Yeah, it was, because uh, it was all, all the trash that I talked. Actually, at that point, I hadn't even talked about all the trash. But they're a super cool, uh, super cool group of people and uh, company. And I've, I've tried to learn a bunch of And my friends with Han, oh, good, good question. Han uh, and at, at one of those tournaments that I was talking about earlier in 2018, he was there. And he was like, oh my god, I have such fond memories. Because uh, I've seen Hans when he was nine. And Hans, young Hans reminds me of me. Because like everybody hated him and everybody hated me because we had the same exact personalities. We were really good at chess, but we were so annoying. <laughs> and you know, I like this, I watched this kid grow up in, in New York City and you know, he was always like loud, boisterous, but he was still getting invited to, you know, group lessons and things like that because he was so strong at chess, so people respected that. And they thought he's 90, he's 10, like he'll be okay. Uh, and then on the flip side, you meet nine and ten year olds that are angels, right? So one of the thing is, when I, when I was teaching chess, is that you have five and six year olds that are, that are menaces, that are like emotional terrorists, like they, they, they bully everybody, adult, child, baby, like it doesn't matter what age you are, or if you can even speak the language yet, they will bully you. These kids are just like angels, right? So um, Hans reminded me of me, uh, and I, I played him a couple of times. I played him, I think he was maybe like 15 or 16. I played him at the Marshall Chess Club, and he beat me. This was, I think, when I was still a little bit higher rated than him. Uh, he crushed me. He played like some super aggressive way. I was like, he's terrible. I, I, none of this other Han stuff existed. So I was like, ah, he's like so arrogant. I'm going to crush him. And he beat me. Like completely outplayed me. And then I played him in a tournament in Texas in 2016. Uh, and uh, I, I prepared well. That's like, again, using some statistics and stuff. I, I played like the third most popular move in the position. And I kind of surprised him. And, you know, he made a mistake. And I managed to convert. So we had a record of one to one. And uh, in 2020, 2019, 2020, like he was still kind of this like 2400 rated kid and teenager, and you know maybe he was going to college. I think he was like applying for Harvard with you know the chess accolades and things like that. That's what I remember. And uh, I saw him at tournaments, and he was just like any normal teenage dude. You know, he would like hang out with his friends. There was like uh, there was like the chess girls who were the same age. You know, you see all the teenagers hanging out together. I was like, he's just like a regular. 2400 and he's trying to gain ELO, just like the rest of us. Um, and then, you know, a couple months ago, he plays a tournament in Charlotte, he does super well, 
one of the first tournaments I've ever seen a person play nine grandmasters when there are not just grandmasters in the field. So like he won his first round, then he won his second round, he made a bunch of draws. I said, wow, he played nine GMs, that's super impressive. Uh, and I was like, well, he'll probably be grandmaster too, like all these kids, you know, they end up being, you know, 12, 13, 14, like I play them, I beat them, then they're stronger than me, and then, you know, they become GM. I've just, I, I've seen it all the time. And, well, now, now we're here. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I watched him stream on Twitch, and I watched him, you know, they would. And I, I thought, okay, well, this is, you know, this is super cool. We have a guy that's like a bit of a trash talker, a bit brash, like yells a lot, but he's actually backing it up. It was like watching the, you know, meteoric rise of, let's say, McGregor, right? I mean, for, for fight fans, I mean, you just have this electric personality. Uh, and then, um, well, yeah, I mean, cheating scandal, right? Like that, that, that was wild. And I, um, I, I mean, I, I was not friends with him even before this happened. I just kind of knew of him. And would still be friendly with him to this day. But I've always thought that the best thing for him to do with all of this, and some of you might agree or disagree, he should just come out and be like, look, this thing is over. Um, and uh, when I was a teenager, I cheated online. He said it himself, right? That's not like new news. Yeah, like that was really stupid. And uh, I'm not gonna do it anymore. Uh, and I haven't done it since. And um, I'm sorry, like, let's move on. And then he could like go back to doing the, the trash talking. I'm gonna win this tournament. You know, gonna be like world champion but instead he's kind of turned into like a chess villain yeah. so he's just like attacking everybody and i don't think that's a sustainable strategy but i'm also not a pr manager so uh that stuff sells right like that stuff always gets into the top of our algorithms you open twitter you open anything if it's negative it's pushing it there because you're like you read it you like feel a certain way nobody wants to see any of the positive stuff every time i write something positive on social media it doesn't get promoted <laughs> it's like incredible and then i'll write something sarcastic or you know, borderline like you know, make, getting people to like start arguing with each other, and, and Twitter's like, yep, 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 and it just goes up to people that like don't even follow him. So uh, I, I'm excited to see what happens to Hans. Like I, but that asterisk will never. I, I don't think it's ever going to go away because for him it's one of two things. Every time he succeeds, but he beats, you know, <laughs> it's like, like, oh, you know, he's, uh, and then and if he doesn't, it's like, ah, see, you know, more scrutiny on him. So now he's like. Never going to go away, and um, you know it sucks, but that's I suppose I suppose that's life. Um, let's see, what was the question? What was the like? Uh, we get a few more questions in here. Can we connect on LinkedIn? Uh, probably. If you request, if you request me on LinkedIn, I go on there like once a week, and then I I'll just accept a bunch of people. I have like four hundred, so I, I get really distracted by the scroll through and accept people. Um, but if you if you request me, you know we might connect. You know, statistically speaking, someone in here will, will be a founder of like a multi-billion dollar startup. So, you know, maybe we can do some cool stuff together in the future. <laughs> and uh, you, you, you never know. Uh, I do get invited to a lot of different things. Like there was a question earlier about drinks. Um, so, you know, if I say like, I'm going to Dubai for the World Championship. I told this to the, the club officer yesterday. I'll have a guy in the chat like, come to my house. Bro, I, I have a house in Dubai you, for you, Lucy. We have a guest bedroom. You know, my wife and I would love to treat you to dinner. We'll show you all the places in Dubai. I just said I'm going to London for November 16th to 22nd like, because uh, they want me to do some, some book events. And they, they are really, really excited about the book. It's like impossible to get American media to talk about the book because they just want to talk about all the horrible things. The UK is like, a book? Yes, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Like, oh my God, BBC Radio. And that's, like, that's amazing. You know, I'm, I'm blown away by their response. But immediately, I'm getting people who go, hey, what's up? I uh, promise I'm totally normal. Here's like three of my social media accounts. You know, my buddies and I, we do like a, like a chess thing. And um, so actually, I, I was invited to something. I'm, I'm going to do something for the very first time in my life. I think tomorrow, today's Saturday, right? Tomorrow in New York, a guy said, hey, I'm, uh, it's my friend's birthday. And we're going to have like lunch here. So could you stop by and surprise him? Which sounds like ridiculous, right? Like, why would any, and, 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 and I thought, oh, my wife and I are going shopping, so we're gonna be like 10 minutes away. You know what? And then the email I'll keep with, you know, if you ever wanna do any events or whatever, like, it would be very nice. I thought, okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'll try that, but I can't accommodate every request, obviously, but um, that is like, that is generally how it goes. So uh, yes, please request me on, on, on LinkedIn. It's a very, 
long-winded way of, uh, of saying that. Who am I rooting for in the candidates after Hikaru? Oh, smart. Yes, uh, definitely rooting for Hikaru. I am. I cannot believe he blew it last time. I was so sad. Uh, candidates, tournament who determines a place for the World Championship. Hikaru was like in a prime position to get second place, and had he gotten second place, he would have played for the title because Magnus was saying that he wasn't going to defend it. Um, and then he lost to uh, to take the red. And uh, who am I rooting for? That is very tough. Because I got to think like, what's good for content? What's good for international? Uh, Prague or Faruja? Probably. Like Prague and Nanda or uh, or Faruja. I want one of the young guys to win. Having said that, do they have the experience to win the world championship? I don't know who has a better nervous system. Um, and I guess who's the last spot? It's looking like it's going to be Anish Giri, right? He's always good. Anish Giri, probably most normal chess player, top chess player I have ever met. So, I'm uh, seriously, you, you ever see that guy anywhere? I don't know why you would, but if you're traveling and somehow, or uh, if any of you want to come to Toronto in December, there's probably going to be some fan zone. So, ah, he's not playing there. Okay, don't come to Toronto if you want to meet Anish Giri. Uh, but he's he, he's a uh, he's super nice. So is Fabiano. Uh, you, uh, you and I know like about the same about the top chess player. I barely have a chance to like actually interact with them. Uh, am I good at checkers? Duh. <laughs> All the pieces move the same. <laughs> it's like just a much easier version of chess, right? You gotta think ahead. Like there's combinations. I really like checkers because pieces move the same. Like I don't have to think all these different, you know, complicated plans. Uh, no, the university prevents it apparently. But you can buy like beanies which are not mine. They're, they're chess like They're nice too. I, I, I wanted to make a copy of them, but I think we're just giving these away. There's some sort of plan. Um, okay, I'm very excited to see this question. How much money to go back to your 2017 haircut? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody knows or doesn't know? Uh, back then, it was in 2018 because I wasn't streaming in 2017. To get, when I first got a thousand subscribers on Twitch, which was a big deal. Uh, I dyed my hair like silver blonde, and it looked so good for 24 hours. <laughs> and then I have like steel wool hair, you know. Also, apparently I say wool weird. Like it was like sorry, like I say wool. I don't know. It's supposed to be wool. I have steel wool hair, and uh, it looked awful. It just looked like a mop that was used to clean a mess and like abandoned. And it was dry and like rusty. And I had to put in product. They, they were telling me that I was just too lazy. So now I'm having my like <coughs> happy, slowly receding hairline. And then once I like start going bald, I'll just like look like a gangster. I'll just shave the whole thing. I'll look like a you know, and I'll have the beard. I'll have the beard. And I'll, I'll look like a, like a villain. But uh, no, I'm not dyeing my hair blonde. It was so bad. Uh, some people look good with 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 dyed hair and hair jeans. <laughs> is not what I got from my parents. Mom has like. Long hair, curly hair, my dad, and he goes, it's like this, so. Um, how did I come up with Gotham Chess? Uh, very short answer for this one. Uh, I thought, okay, so uh, I have you know, no YouTube channel yet, and I want to be known for something, and I live in New York, and New York is Gotham, so I'm gonna be Gotham, and since I make chess content, I'm gonna be Gotham Chess. But what I always say is, it turns out that Gotham was named after Chicago. <laughs> Slight oversight, but nobody really knows that. So now it's come with another set of problems. Like uh, I was not able to get a trademark for one of the categories because it overlaps too closely with DC Comics. And so sometimes I'm sitting there going, "What if DC one day said you can't call yourself this, or you can't have a Batman logo?" Because I have these like wooden sculptures, you know, behind me that people made actually, like fans who are woodworkers built these wooden kings and queens and sent them to me, which is super super cool of them. I thought, what if, what if that happens? I thought, you know what, the negative PR it would generate for them would probably help me. I would just change my name to, like, I am Levy. Like, uh, or, or, or not Levi. That's, that was always going to be my, uh, it's just not Levi. Uh, but I don't know. Yeah, that, that it was a pretty short process. I just wanted to be known for something. Because everybody's like, this question just keeps, <laughs> you would think it would somehow get, get uh, what, what did this answer? Okay, cool. Um, oh, this is, do we do it like last two people you want? Yeah. Oh, you just learned it. I thought it was going to be like abandoned on an island or something. <laughs> oh, you're saying, oh, okay. Not to be 
people I don't want to see, the people I do want to see. Uh, Magnus, <laughs> but he's not going to play. Um, I can't actually give him that groundbreaking of an answer because I think I think it's already determined. I think it's going to be Perusha and Anish Giri. But I'd like to see Gukesh, right? I mean, two young Indian teenagers, then we have Ali Reza. Look, the problem with top level chess is it's the same dudes in every tournament. That's why these uh, events are really fun, like Grand Swiss, because they play against people who are weaker than them traditionally. But normally, the way top level chess has worked for years, they just take 15 players and they just play these tournaments. And these tournaments have sponsors that are either local for 100 years, like any of you can watch Tata Seal in January, which is in Baikonze in the Netherlands. A tournament's been going on for 100 years. It's like a Wimbledon, basically, of chess. And, um, or you have millionaires who just like chess, like Singfield Cup. Everything in St. Louis, in, I, as far as I know, is basically based on the efforts of Rex Singfield, who was just like a, a billionaire from Missouri, and he built the St. Louis Chess Club, the Hall of Fame, the Kingside Diner, if any of you have been there, I highly recommend going. And it's just an entire city block of chess buildings now. And I went, and, and not only that, there's a side street with townhouses, all chess houses. So grandmasters moved to St. Louis and just get put into a house. Like they can just live there. I mean, this doesn't exist really anywhere else, and if it wasn't for his efforts, a bunch of these players wouldn't even represent the states, and a bunch of these tournaments wouldn't even be happening. And that's kind of an issue, right? Like when we watch tennis or NFL or anything, there's just sponsors. It's just like they run ads all the time. And okay, maybe chess would have more ads if that was the case, but the issue is it's not, uh, we don't have like a, it's not based here. The International Chess Federation is based in I don't even know if they have headquarters. I mean, it was, I think it was Russia for a long time, or that's like still official, but it's it's very like Eastern based. I mean, it's a lot of a lot of Russian influence. They're doing events in Uzbekistan. They're doing an event in Kazakhstan, right? Some events in India, Dubai. It's like that side of the map, the right side of the map, if you look at the map. And it's not, the, the tournament that's in Toronto at the candidates is um, the first ever candidates in North America. You believe that? Like. The tournament who determines who plays for the World Chess Championship is in the, the North America for the first time. There was like maybe one in the 50s or 60s that was like a knockout or something, some event. But that's that's crazy, you know. And that that's tough. That's why it's tough to. Uh, it's just the same guys like over and over. So, um, Ukash, Giri, uh, Firuja, but you know, um, myself. <laughs> what are like what my average game length would be? I would get zero, but I wonder, you know, could I survive like 40 moves? Fifty moves against some of these players. Uh, best Riz strat. <laughs> um, so I didn't know that Riz could be cultivated. I thought this was something you had or you didn't. Uh, probably like you know, high elo helps. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, be yourself. Don't change for anybody. Yada yada yada. Uh, and uh, don't try to force yourself too hard to uh, belong if somebody's trying to. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, can you sign my book? Actually, technically, no. Technically, we were like, there's too many people, and people are going to start bringing things like shirts or foreheads. So maybe if I'm playing, like, you catch me for like a couple seconds, um, perhaps, but just in terms of crowd control. Is this a beard? You asking me? Ah, yes. <laughs> yes. Or you're asking me, I, I don't your know. Favorite. I, is your trash talk ever make someone cry? No. <laughs> yes. Twice. Twice. Uh, once, I grew up playing chess in the Susan Polgar Chess Club in Queens, New York. Uh, Susan Polgar, one of the most accomplished players ever, and she had a chess club in Forest Hills, New York. And I had a, a rival there by the name of James. Uh, and um, yeah, if any of you are James, <laughs> suck. No, I, so I think he's like 30 now. So I, just, I look at people who were my year in chess, and I was like, I played this dude in the third grade nationals, and he beat me. I wonder what he's doing. That's a scumbag. And he's just like an insurance officer. And works at like normal job. Quit chess like 10 years ago. This is always a very fun thing for me to do. Um, anyway, James and I always talk trash uh, in uh, Susan Borger's club. And I once, we were sitting across from each other, and you know we were, we were trash talking. So he picked up a knife and threw it point blank at my face. <laughs> like this distance. He hit me. I have a big head. Back then it was even more disproportionate. It was like Jimmy Neutron. It was like this big. <laughs> yeah, he hit me like right here. I guess, you know, angry, crying, and, and um, only one other time. 
But I think uh, I think the second time, it's like twelve years ago, and I, I believe we absolved. It, it it was more like a there was a very annoying kid in chess camp, and people had to put him in his place. And it wasn't just like me solo. People just started thinking he was like even better than we were. He was just a super annoying kid, uh, and uh, we were like playing lids, trash talking, and then out of nowhere he started to cry. I've made people cry over the board without saying anything to them. Like, I don't know if any of you have played kids, they just cry, <laughs> like, super randomly. And you feel really good, though. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. I, I, I mean, I, I think that
Uh, pro probably not. But if some company said, hey, we'll sponsor you for like three months, we'll put logos all over you, we'll give you five million. I mean, you just gotta win the fight, right? But uh, I don't know, I think the risk reward is uh, probably not not there for me. I'll let like other people do it. But I, I was at Creator Clash, I was at Chess Boxing, super fun events. Isn't it like weird how we glorify violence at that level? Yeah. Anyway, separate, separate conversation. Time management. Whoa. How much do you spend time working on content, other projects? Uh, how do you keep the motivation up? Do you have advice for others on personally driven projects? <laughs> yeah, tough. I mean, what made it easy for me, at least in college, to know that I could keep chess for a career is people were doing it, right? And so if you're in a big enough city, it, this is like a hyper-specific thing, but I was always thinking of uh, growth and scale. What, what really uh, makes me excited to do basically anything, not just in chess, is I have an idea, so how can we turn this into something in one year? What's the plan in three years? What's the plan in 10 years? I really like building houses. I just finished building a house in front of me. I'm just fascinated by like all the moving components, uh, everything that has to get done, what timeline, like this, like six different timelines, what has to get to the That's just the way my brain works. And that's the stuff that I really enjoy because it's like solving a huge puzzle. Chess makes it easy because it's basically the only skill that I have a mastery in. It is the only skill I have a mastery in, uh, not basically. And um, I think the one thing that has helped the channel grow to the point it is, is uh, I'm able to, to put myself into the shoes of other people. That's, I think that's called empathy, or sympathy. it's called empathy. And that's like my whole life. And that's actually a very annoying skill to have when you have to have serious conversations, or when you think you've been wronged, but then you spend hours thinking about it from the other person's perspective, and then you convince yourself you're the fucking problem. Like, so it's good to have empathy, it's good like to a point. Um, and I think for the channel specifically, it allows me to think of how people see chess, how people uh, want to be entertained by chess, what, what, what they're curious about, uh, and it helps putting together those types of things. And the next step of that is, obviously the book is now done. I've been asked a lot if there's gonna be a second one. I'm currently deciding if the next book is going to be at a higher level than the current one, or for children. And there are, I think, more children in the world than intermediate chess players. So you're kind of fighting a losing battle. <laughs> but but yeah, why not? Well, the problem with books is they take two years. So the next book they already told me is gonna come out, if it comes out, like October 2025 which just seems like a millennia away, you know? Uh, so I'm, I'm probably gonna get to work on things like that. And then, other things. How many of you watched Physical 100 on Netflix? Not a lot of people, highly recommend it. I don't know if it's still out. It's like a, it's like Squid Game, it's like elimination style. It's, it's all, it's Korean based, but it's just really, really jacked men and women doing crazy challenges. Like holding a 100 pound boulder for an hour. Okay, super fun, elimination style. I thought, why can't we do that in chess? Why can't we just select like 64 people, because there's 64 squares on a chessboard, all walks of life, you know, or good players, famous chess players, or just regular people, I don't know. Probably regular people would be cheaper, because those guys might request the appearance fees. But, and then you just eliminate people by the half, like a knockout, 32, 16, eight, and then at the end you have eight people, and they just play a knockout tournament against each other. And uh, stuff like that, like th this is the stuff I spend time thinking about, or Gotham Chess Club. Right? If any of you have been to New York City, we have one chess club. It's very historic. A lot of history has happened there. A lot of tournaments have happened there. There's being on the floor. Like, you know, chess clubs have negative stereotypes, and they exist for a reason. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, go, I don't really go there a huge amount because we cramped, like, we cramped, like, the downstairs room has maybe room for 30 people until it becomes a fire hazard. And it's just, like, I, I, want, I want something a little bit nicer. So we have. In, in New York, we have, um, we have ping pong clubs that you could go to that play jazz and they're a little bit more grungy, but then we have really nice ping pong clubs where you have people just walking around with huge nets and they just pick up and then you can get food delivered to your table, you can get uh, a drink, there's also music and performance, they're really nice, they just pay a little bit more, but so I thought, how can I like do put something together, right, something like that. Um, and uh, this, how do I stay motivated? I think there's always something left to build. So the day that I sit there and go, well, everything that I would like to exist in chess or for anybody in the future who will be interested in chess has officially been put in place. See ya. Uh, I don't think we are anywhere close to that, but um, I think you, you, know, you obviously have to experience a little bit of success. You can't just, if anybody here is designing shoes that can you know, uh, be little jetpacks and float you off the ground and it hasn't worked for years and you know, you're 
living on the street because you ran out of funds to fund. Like, you know, there's got to be a, a limit to being self-driven as well. You have to uh, prioritize more than anything else. So you have to be able to, to get the most important stuff done and out of the way. Uh, and then, for me, I mean, it's it's everything. Like, before I went to the airport yesterday, I recorded two videos so that one could come out today because I won't have time to record one today. And, like, I didn't have to do that, but I had an extra hour before I went to JFK. And I thought, okay, I'll record, you know, two different videos. And I, I enjoy doing it. I, I, I'm constantly thinking of ideas. I'm writing them down on my phone. Do that. Journal your ideas or else they will disappear because that always happens to me and it's very frustrating. Uh, and uh, I think the most important thing is, like, try to be able to see it from the other person's standpoint, like what you are even trying to build or accomplish, because that's that's probably why, like I said, like that's that's probably why people have, have watched the channel and sort of come back to it. Um, I, in the interest of time, I feel like we should play some Blitz. Now, I don't know how that works at all, so I will defer that to, to you guys. Do we have another QR code thing? Uh, <laughs> okay, no problem. Okay. Uh, can I keep talking into the microphone? It's, yeah, kind, of, it's, kind, it's kind of fun. Cool. Anybody want to shout some questions or something? How does the night move? How do you play chess blindfolded? Um, it's very difficult, and it's not something that I ever practiced. Uh, I think you just have to play enough chess not blindfolded. Um, also, like, how do I see the board? It's just there. You close your eyes, and then it's just there, you know? And it, if it's not there for yeah, you yet, good. that's okay. That's not actually that useful of a skill. It just makes you look really smart. But if you actually play a full game of chess blindfolded, you will be very tired, and your life will be 